we are going to discuss how to set a ventilator for people who don't do this regularly. So let or me people who do it regularly and still get confused by it. Or people like me who say, what do you want to do to the respiratory therapist? <laughs> right. And you lots get, of us right have path. respiratory therapists who do much of this for us. But maybe it's good to understand what they are doing. And for all the viewers who work in places where they don't have an RT constantly helping because them out. Because it's like our RNs. Our RNs are amazing. They're doing all the IVs until they can't get the IV. And then they ask you. And I'm like, what? It's like RT. They're like, I got this. Until something goes really, really bad. They're like, well, hey, what do you want me to do? And I'm like, oh, no. Oh, no. Full circle. So we're going to give you some confidence today. I like it. Because we're going to run you through all of this knowledge, whether you never set vents or you do it all the time. It's always useful to have an understanding of the concepts. So we're going to talk about the modes that we use, what initial settings look like, and then how to adjust those settings to customize it for your patient. Now, it's useful to have a bit of an overview about the ventilator, because when it comes down to it, ventilators are kind of stupid machines. All they do is blow air in. They don't even help you exhale. The patient has to do all that on their own. So when you're setting a mode, you're setting the parameters of that inhalation, which specifically is when it starts blowing air in and when it stops blowing air in. And so we can divide these modes into two big categories based on whether your patient is apneic or whether they are breathing. And this often comes down to, have you done a rapid sequence induction? Because if you've just RSI'd your patient, they're going to be apneic. And otherwise, perhaps you've done an awake and you still have a breathing patient. But in the case of the apneic patient, obviously they can't trigger their own breath anymore. So the vent needs to do that for them. And it does it based on time. So if you set a respiratory rate of 12, the vent is going to start blowing air in every five seconds, like clockwork, literally. Whereas if your patient is awake and breathing, they will trigger the breath themselves. They will start to inhale, the vent registers this pressure deflection, and then will help them by delivering a breath. So really it's like the difference between a paralyzed patient and a non-paralyzed patient. Exactly. Or a dead patient <laughs> and a not dead patient. Yes, and I mean, hopefully if you're ventilating them for a long time, they're at least partially alive. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes. I like that. So the aptic, they just can't do the breath by themselves. Right. And that's our most common category, right? Mm -hmm. If we're most commonly doing rapid sequence induction or mm -hmm. using paralytics when we're putting these tubes in, then generally we're going to be using this top row of information. Got it. All right. And so we call these modes of ventilation different things. When people are apneic and they're on this time-based mode, we call this controlled ventilation or full ventilation. And part of how intensivists make this complicated is by having multiple terms for the same thing. But if your intensivist is asking you, is the patient fully vented? This is what they're asking. Are they on a controlled mode of ventilation? Or maybe they're even asking, is the patient apneic? And that's what they want to know. In contrast, when your patient is breathing, we call this spontaneous modes of ventilation or sometimes support modes of ventilation. So if we understand how the two breaths are triggered, we then need to tell the machine when to stop blowing the air in. It needs to have a limit for when it stops. And so when you're in controlled or full ventilation, you can set one of two things. You either set a pressure limit or a volume limit. And the vent stops blowing air in when it hits that pressure or when it hits that volume. And that's how it knows to stop. And we call this pressure control or volume control. Or some places will even call this assist control ventilation is one of the other terms for this. And most centers will use either one or the other routinely. And so you'll get comfortable with seeing that used on a regular basis because these are probably our most common modes that we're setting initially. For the patient who's breathing spontaneously, the breath typically ends with a pressure limit. So the patient will start the breath the machine will give them a pressure boost to help them. And when it hits the pressure you've set, it stops blowing air in. And we call this pressure support. The other common spontaneous mode that people use in the emergency department is non-invasive ventilation. So when you're setting a BiPAP machine, that is a type of pressure support. The patient is initiating every breath and they're getting a pressure boost from the machine on each breath. And so volume I get, like I'll be like, oh, you take uh, whatever, 600 uh, milliliters uh, of air. That's the volume that's going to go in your lungs. 
the pressure is that end pressure is just how much pressure at full expansion of the lungs. Is that like what you're talking about in terms of pressure? Absolutely. So the vent is blowing air in and it's measuring the pressure that is entering your lungs. And when it gets to the limit you've set, it stops. All right. So, as, so the bit, as the bag fills up, it'll pressure it go up, 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 stop, and then... Exactly. Same concept as blowing up a balloon. Right. But in general, with the lungs, your volume and your pressure are going to go up and down together. They're going to track linearly. Yep. Okay. So if we understand the initial modes and choosing either a controlled mode or a pressure support mode, you then still need to set some initial settings. And these are standard uh, things that you would set on any ventilator. And so the things you need to set are an FiO2, a PEEP, either your pressure or your volume limit that we've discussed, a respirate and a flow. And I used to think, uh, I mean, at my place, the RTs come and do a lot of this without me even saying anything. I used to think it was sort of magic. Um, and what I've come to understand is they just memorized a basic starting point and they start there. And then they adjust based on the the patient themselves. And this this concept for me, the thing that made it click for me is when I understood that this is like a procedural sedation. So if you're gonna do a procedural sedation on somebody, you pick the drugs you wanna use and you start somewhere at some safe dose and then you titrate based on how that individual patient is responding to where you've started. A ventilator is the same way. You memorize an initial safe starting point and then you adjust. And so for me, these are the initial settings that I use. Start with an FiO2 kind of in the middle, 50%, and I can turn it up or down to the saturation I want. And this happens very quickly, the same as you would titrate nasal prongs. You can just turn this up or down at the bedside. A PEEP of five is a safe starting place for almost anybody. Now PEEP is positive end expiratory pressure. That means a little bit of pressure at the end of expiration to hold your lungs open. This is holding the alveoli open to give you better VQ matching which means overall that you get better oxygenation. So everybody can have five of PEEP. Now at my place, we're a volume control type of place, so I'm typically setting a tidal volume, but if you are a pressure control type of place, that's okay too, we'll talk about that in a second. But for us, I'm setting a tidal volume of six to eight cc's per kilo. This is on the low side. So this is lung protective ventilation, which has been shown in the literature to be safe for people because it avoids that consequence of over distending the lungs and getting into barotrauma or pneumothoraces. I'll start with a respirate around 12 to 14 and a flow of about 60 liters per minute is reasonable. The flow is how much air you feel blowing in your face. If you turn it up really high, patients feel like they're in a wind tunnel. If you have it too low, they feel like they're sucking and gasping for air. They stay air hungry. So you want to adjust the flow up or down until the patient seems comfortable. So just to clarify, the FiO2, that's the fraction of inspired oxygen. So is that like how much oxygen is in the air that's going to be delivered? Absolutely. So this means the air or the mix of medical gas and air going down your tubing is going to be 50% oxygen and 50% air. Got it. And so it can go up to like a max of 100%? It can go up to a max of 100%. Uh, and we don't go lower than 21%, which would be what's in room, room air. Right. Um, we try not to keep people up at 100 for long periods of time because there can be uh, detrimental effects to the lungs. It can cause inflammation and free radical formation. For an hour or two, it's not a big deal. Uh, but for long term, for the patient waiting several hours to go to the ICU, you'd probably want them, say, 60% or lower if you could. You can't for everybody, but if you could, it would be ideal. Got it. So if I could reframe this a little bit, the FiO2 then is what kind of air is going inside? Yes. The PEEP or positive end expiratory pressure is how much the lung is still open after the breath is delivered. And then the tidal volume is how much air is going in. Yes. And the respiratory rate is how frequently the air is going in. And then the flow is how fast is the air going in with each breath. Exactly. Got it. Now, I understand how to adjust all all of those except the flow. Does that make a huge difference? Because it seems to me like if I'm going to be increasing my flow, then I'm just going to be getting that volume faster. Is that? Right. And so uh, it depends which mode you've started them with. Mm -hmm. But often starting around 60 is reasonable. And we usually titrate this in increments of 10. So if you start at 60 and your patient still looks air hungry, 
Maybe you turn them up to 70 and see how they look. Even 80 might be about as high as I would go on the standard patient. You can also go down a little. You could go down to 50 or 40 if they sort of seem like they're getting blown away by whatever you've set. All right. All right. So there are a few pitfalls here that we want to avoid. Number one, when you're setting their tidal volume, we don't use people's actual body weight, which is a good thing because now you don't have to ask people what they weigh because they weren't going to tell you the honest answer anyway. Um, but guys, what do we use instead of their actual body weight? I'm going to assume the ideal body weight. The ideal body yeah. weight, right? So you need to know their gender and their height. That's how we calculate it. And you can just plug it into MedCalc and it'll give you what their ideal or predicted body weight is. That's because our lungs don't get fat. True. So you want to use their um, their predicted body weight or their ideal body weight to give you a decent size number. And so to give you an impression of that, I mean, say we're ventilating Paul. I'm going to say Paul's 70 kilos. I don't know what he really weighs, but that might be 68. his... 68. <laughs> 68 makes yeah, the wish. math really hard mm -hmm. for me. So could I go with 70? Yes, absolutely. And so I'm going 6 cc's per kilo. So his tidal volume is going to be around 420 cc's in each breath. And that would be a reasonable starting ballpark for the average 70 kilo person. Got it. The ideal body weight for my height and my gender. Correct. Got it. Right. So in fact, rather than assuming you're 70 kilos, I would say, hey, sir, how tall are you? And if right. I can, four, I four, can yeah, generally two. infer gender, four. but sometimes <laughs> I can't. So two. He's, he's four foot he's, two. He's on a couple blocks here. Oh, he's, he's, he's on a, I saw the stepladder behind him. I didn't know what that was for. Um, right. So once I know their height uh, and I know their gender, then I just plug that in and it, the calculator spits out their Got predicted it. body weight. All right. All right. The second tip here is that all of your initial settings need a safety check to make sure they are reasonable. So if you have started by setting a volume control mode, so you've set a tidal volume, say we've set for Paul his 420 cc's, which was 6 cc's per kilo to start out with. I then want to have a look on the ventilator at my plateau pressures. And this is something that the vent will just display to you. It will say plateau pressure or it will say P plat. Uh, and you can look at what that number is on a breath to breath basis, typically. Uh, and you want to keep your plateau pressures less than 30 centimeters of water. And the if plateau pressure is the pressure at full uh, inflation of the lungs. Is that right? Or at full inflation on a breath hold. Okay. So your initial pressure will peak higher in the first less than a second and then hold at a plateau. Mm -hmm. Same as it takes more pressure to blow up a balloon than it does to keep it open once it's open. Your mm -hmm. lungs are the same concept. So your plateau pressure less than 30 means the pressure that your alveoli are actually seeing is safe for them. When okay. we take these pressures too high, you run the risk of popping one and getting yourself a pneumothorax. All right. All right. So say I set Paul on my 420 cc's, but his plateau pressures are up around 32, 34. Too high, not safe. I need to turn his tidal volume down a little bit. So I will dial him down 20, 30 cc's maybe and check that his plateau pressures are less than 30. So this is my safety check that whatever I've chosen initially is actually safe for him and not going to harm him by making the pressure too high. So the converse situation is if you've set a pressure control instead, because maybe you work in a pressure control center and that's fine. So if you want to start setting a pressure control, I usually start with 10 centimeters of water as your initial driving pressure. And then I want to check to make sure that the volumes are acceptable. And so I would have a look at the tidal volume and make sure I'm keeping them between six to eight cc's per kilo. So no matter what you set, you need to have calculated your patient's ideal tidal volume because you either are going to set that up front or you're going to use that in your safety check. So you want to make sure you're documenting an ideal or predicted body weight for all of these patients who are ventilating. I love how with regard to the safety check, depending on which mode you're using if it's pressure control or volume control you're using the opposite as your safety check for me i've always used predominantly the volume and so for me it's the pressure and so the plateau pressure the number i always remember is 30 and even to this day it's funny because i don't interact that much with ventil the ventilator itself and so i have to ask the rt and say hey can you just show me or like i'll just watch them do it especially when i was starting out can you just show me what you're doing and how you're doing it and those kind of conversations builds rapport with your rt and also helps you learn like what they're doing so that if they're not there you can check it yourself 
Absolutely, right? And spending that one minute with your RT every time you intubate can be so valuable. Every time you pick up one new tip, and before yeah. you know it, you really get a deeper understanding of how they're managing the vent. Um, and they're they're great teachers, so yeah. we should take advantage of that. Is it okay to take Paul's approach and be like, look, I never want to use pressure control because I just want to remember volume control. Is there any any instances where I'm like, no, you need to use pressure control for this patient and you can't use volume control or can I just say pick one? Uh, my opinion is that it's perfectly okay to just pick one and stick with it. You may find the ICU changes it. The ICU may tend to use different advanced modes. Uh, and in the ICU, we like to fight over event modes, which is fine. That's fun for us. Um, but there's no reason why you need to get super advanced in those first few hours in the emergency department. Okay. If I'm setting these vents, I set volume control every time, period, done. Yeah, volume control it is then. Yeah, keep it simple. <laughs> keep it no simple. No one thing really well, at least, yeah. <laughs> exactly, right? And you want to just remember your one set of numbers or you have your one set of initial starting numbers written down or in your phone somewhere and you roll them out every time. Sounds great. Awesome. So we've discussed these initial settings as what I use for my default patient when I want to provide lung protective ventilation. I do want to remind you about patients who have obstructive lung disease. And these are your patients with COPD or asthma, mm -hmm. because I do start slightly differently for these patients. I will still use my same FiO2 and PEEP, but I will increase their tidal volume to the higher end of that range. I will start them at eight cc's per kilo because they tend to be hyperinflated at baseline and can tolerate a bigger tidal volume. And I will slow down their rest rate to 10 and still make sure they're getting decent flows of 60 to 80, but the rest rate is key here. I wanna slow that down. Guys, can you tell me why would I wanna slow it down in COPD patients? For me, I think the way I think about it is that they can contain a lot of air, but their problem is, I think of the wheezing, it's like they just can't get it out. So that's like almost like breathing through a straw. You wanna give more time to be able to let that out. Right, exactly. So COPD patients have trouble exhaling. They have long exhalation times. They need more time to get all that air out. So we slow them down to give them that time they need to fully exhale. And so while I start at 10, you want to be careful to decide that that rate is actually the acceptable number for these people because you don't want them too low or too high. And so when I'm at the bedside, I will check a flow time graph and I'm gonna show you just the basics of this graph, but your RT can display it for you on the ventilator and it's going to give you breath to breath information. So this is a bit of an advanced concept, stay with me here, uh, but I think we can all master this. It's a STEMI with T-wave inversions. <laughs> it's a STEMI, it. call the cath lab. STEMI. <laughs> abstract STEMI. <laughs> it's a STEMI with its big deep T. They are version. like tombstones, yeah. right? I see that. I got a square tombstone. When we're looking at the flow time graph, this flow here is your inhalation. So this is where flow is blowing into the patient. And below that horizontal line uh, is your exhalation here. So here flow stops and is flowing out of the patient. And this keeps going, inhalation, exhalation, inhalation, exhalation. So you're gonna see this real time. And what you want to see on the exhalation phase is this line of their exhalation coming back to that zero horizontal line. That means they have had time to fully exhale before the next breath blows in. And that's a really important concept. So you wanna see them coming back to zero. When we haven't done this effectively, it can lead to breath stacking, which is also called auto peep or dynamic hyperinflation. So here you can see two curves. On this one, the patient is exhaling and coming back to this zero horizontal line. So they're fully exhaling. That's so an appropriate rate. There's no rate. air left in the lungs other than the peep. Correct. All right. There's no extra air left there, which is what you're shooting for. In this solid line, the patient is trying to exhale does not fully exhale and then the vent starts blowing in the next inhale and leaves them with that small section of air. So they are trapping a little bit of air, which on one breath is probably not a big deal, but on multiple breaths, that little bit of air keeps accumulating and accumulating and accumulating until you blow up the patient's lungs with high pressure, with all of this breath stacking, and they can get distressed, the pressure can get so high they don't have adequate venous return. That means they don't have decent circulation going into their right heart, and they can actually start dropping their blood pressure or even have a PEA arrest from lack of perfusion. 
So watching that flow time graph come back to the line tells you that your respiratory rate is acceptable. If they are still breath stacking, you need to slow your rate down. Slowing the rate down just allows that exhalation, that line to go all the way back before to Before another zero. breath is triggered. Exactly. Yeah. Before the vent triggers the next breath. Because the vent doesn't know, right? You've just yeah. set a time and the vent's going to start blowing in air based on that time that you've set, no matter yeah. what, right? It's just following your settings. And so this is your safety check that you've made the respirate appropriate for this COPD patient. And does that tie back to checking your plateau pressure that if you breath stack, breath stack, breath stack, you're gonna see that plateau pressure go greater than 30 because that residual pressure at is the top cumulatively is cumulatively up. higher? Yeah. You are, it's such a good segue and you're gonna start getting high pressure alarms overall. And we're gonna talk about that in the next session when we talk about vent alarms. Nice. And how does that relate to the flow rate? Like if you're increasing the flow rate, is that you're trying to maximize that time just by making the inspiration period shorter? Right, so you can uh, increase flow and consequently make your eye time shorter, yes. And that's part of how you can adjust to give your patient long enough just to more exhale. Time. That's why you're doing your flow rate 60 to 80 as opposed to set to, because you want to try to get as much of that tidal Correct. volume in, like Paul said, in that inspiration. To expand out that. Exactly. So, that longer up. so yeah, short, like that. fast inspiration, blow a lot of air in, but then give them a long time to exhale it out. Got it. Nice. So COPD and asthma. COPD cool. and asthma. Okay, so now we've learned our initial settings. And now you need to understand how to adjust these settings at the bedside to customize them for your individual patient because everybody who comes along will be a little bit different. And we use two main things when we're adjusting our initial settings. One, how the patient is doing clinically at the bedside and two, arterial blood gases. Or if you don't have access to a blood gas, you can use a SAT and an end tidal CO2 uh, or you could use a SAT and a venous blood gas to help you track it as well. Your, your numbers might be slightly inaccurate, but the trend will still be valid uh, and is a useful way to titrate your settings. So in terms of patient status, this is really just how your patient looks at the bedside. Are they comfortable? Is their sat okay? Do they look air hungry? Maybe you need to turn up the flow, but you want a comfortable patient with decent vital signs lying in the bed. And then you're getting blood gases. Usually I'll get my first set maybe 15 minutes after I've intubated. Uh, and then depending on how sick the patient is, maybe every hour or two after that to continue uh, adjusting as the patient changes. And so when we look at common problems we have that lead us to adjust, uh, we need to know what changes to make on the ventilator for these problems. So say I've intubated Paul, where Paul got intubated mm -hmm. today. Uh, and we set his initial settings and that was going pretty well. We put him on volume control and my plateau pressures were less than 30, so I was happy. But Paul is hypoxic. His SAT is not acceptable. Say his SAT is 85 and we're worried about Paul's brain. Uh, so guys, what can I change on the ventilator to help give Paul more oxygen? Give him more oxygen. This is the easy one, right? I can just turn up the FiO2, which is a beautiful thing. Just dial it up. What else could I change on the ventilator? Increase the amount of air that's going in. Volume of air, I should say. Tidal volume. And if not the tidal volume, what else could I do instead? Uh, the pressure. Oh, yes, the peep. Oh, the that's peep. right. It's the peep. Yes. Right, so these are your two moves for hypoxia. You can either dial up the FiO2, which is the easy one, or you can increase the peep. Increasing the PEEP helps you recruit more alveoli. So what this means is you have more lung available for VQ matching, which leads to better oxygenation. And so often if we've started at five of PEEP, perhaps we would turn to eight. If they need even more, you could turn to 10. When you turn your PEEP too high, 15, 18, 20, you can start getting into trouble with your venous return in the same way that you do with dynamic hyperinflation. But otherwise, you can try it and see how the patient responds. You can find, by dialing your PEEP up and down, the number where they seem to be happiest in terms of their oxygen saturation, and then keep them there. Yeah, I like to think of the PEEP as like, this is if this is your alveoli and it's completely collapsed, there's no air in there for the oxygen exchange. If you got that PEEP, you're just keeping that little grape open. And so there's always oxygen, so you're gonna increase mm. just that movement of oxygen across that membrane. Exactly. And in fact, allowing the alveoli to fully close and rub against each other is harmful to them. 
So we always want them to be open a little bit, you know, even on a physiologic basis, as well as an oxygenation basis. If you put your PEEP too high, can you pop their lungs or? Yep. All right. Yep. So I would, I would go up in increments of two or three each time. So if you start at five centimeters of water, going to eight would be reasonable. See how they do at eight, go to 10. Now, while you're doing this, keep an eye on their blood pressure. Mm -hmm. If their blood pressure's dropping, you start worrying about venous return or about have you popped a pneumothorax. Is there a peep that's too high? You're like, look, you've maxed out your peep at this number. If you're, I mean, in the ICU, if I'm over 20, I'm worried. Okay. And in the eMERGE, if you're over 15, I think I'm worried. All right. Um, I would definitely be calling for backup at that stage because you'll start to get into real trouble with your hemodynamics. So 5 to 15 is that range that we're kind of allowed. Absolutely. Of and you want that, if you're going 15, you want a well-resuscitated patient. All right. All right. The other thing to remember here is that you've got to treat their underlying disease because the ventilator doesn't actually fix anybody's medical problem. It just buys you time and oxygenation while your other therapy kicks in. So if this is a pneumonia patient, don't walk away from this patient until you've given them appropriate resuscitation, antibiotics, the therapy they need. If this is CHF, same. Uh, sometimes we have that tendency to intubate and set the ventilator and then walk away and call ICU. But your medical therapy here is the vital part of what's going to make this patient better. Um, and that might be what really fixes their hypoxia rather than any fiddling with the FiO2 and the PEEP. Okay. So the second common problem we see in eMERGE patients is they are hypercarbic. Their PCO2 is too high. And so we have a couple moves on the ventilator for fixing this. Guys, do you have ideas of what we can change on the ventilator when the PCO2 is too high? You have to blow it off. Yeah. yeah. So how can you increase them blowing it off? This is where the respiratory rate and tidal volume come in. Exactly. So this is where you want them to breathe harder and faster because that's going to allow them to blow off more CO2. So we're adjusting either the respiratory rate to turn it up or you're increasing your tidal volume if you've set volume control or your driving pressure if you've set pressure control. Now, the way I remember this, this is the only formula I'm going to give you. And so if it works for you, you can remember it. But your minute ventilation is tidal volume times respiratory rate. And so when I think of people who need to blow off more CO2, I can remember that they need to increase their minute ventilation, which then cues me to those changes on the ventilator, that those are the two things I can increase to help expand their minute ventilation, which will help them blow off the CO2 that I'm looking for. I like that memory tool because I, we always talk about those two concepts of oxygenation and ventilation. So it's like oxygenation or oxygen and ventilation or carbon dioxide. And in the word ventilation itself is minute ventilation, which then keys you in into like those two things, tidal volume and respiratory rate, which kind of drive that CO2. And on the flip side, like for oxygenation, like we were talking about before, it's the other stuff that wasn't those. So like the FiO2 and the PEEP. It's a good memory tool. Exactly. Right. When you have a ventilation problem, think about your minute ventilation. Cool. All right. So to summarize that, when you have a hypoxia problem, your FiO2 and your PEEP are your components of your vent that you can titrate to help either turn your oxygenation up or down to the saturation that you want. I'm generally shooting for a SAT of 95 to 97. I don't go to 100 with very many people because I can make them hyperoxic, but anywhere in the high 90s I think is reasonable. Is there uh, any time that you can go lower than that and keep it kind of safe if you're kind of stuck? Good question. So say your COPD person mm -hmm. who's a might be a CO2 retainer, often we'll keep them at a SAT of 88 to 92. Okay. Uh, and that might be mm -hmm. where they are at home and where they're happier. Um, so thank you for flagging that. All right. uh, otherwise, for hypercarbia problems, we're titrating the tidal volume and their respiratory rate. So what we've walked you through is an overview of the modes, the initial settings, and adjusting those settings. I'm gonna remind you of the high points because sometimes it's useful either just to snap a picture or to write this down to keep it in your memory for the next time you have that intubated patient. In general, in the emergency department, after you've done your rapid sequence, your patient is paralyzed. So you're gonna use full ventilation. The breath is gonna be triggered by time and then you're either gonna set a pressure limit or a volume limit and we'll call that pressure control or volume control. Once you've chosen your mode, you're gonna dial in your default settings and you either use the lung protective settings for your average patient or the obstructive settings for your patients with COPD and asthma. 
And this is just your starting point. You start there and then you check to see if it's safe. You check to make sure your tidal volumes are acceptable and that your plateau pressures are acceptable. You check with your COPD patients to make sure on that flow time graph, their exhalation flow is coming back to that zero line. Once you start there, you have a look at your patient. At the bedside, are they comfortable? Is there anything you need to adjust with flow or their FiO2 to normalize their vital signs? And then you're looking at their blood gas. For hypoxia, you're titrating FiO2 and PEEP. And for hypercarbia, you're titrating tidal volumes and respiratory rate. Sarah, before you wrap it up, I just want to do a quick question because getting an ABG is, I gotta admit, kind of difficult for me in the emergency department. I know you said we can use a VBG, but it's sometimes not as good in terms of the numbers. I do like using my O2 saturation and my end tidal CO2 because that's easy. We have it there. I got my numbers for my O2. What are you shooting for on your end tidal CO2 in terms of making your decisions on increasing your minute ventilation? Is there kind of a range of numbers that you're looking for? Yeah, good question. So in the person with normal lungs, I'm shooting for a PCO2 of 40. And let me talk about PCO2 first, and mm -hmm. then we'll extend this out to your end title. Uh, so normal lungs, I want a normal PCO2, which is 40. For somebody with COPD, they may have a baseline PCO2 in the 50s or 60s. All right. So I want to look back in the chart and find out where they live and shoot for that number. And then I like tracking with the end tidal CO2. It's easier than repeatedly doing gases, but I try to do at least one gas. And at the time that I send the gas, I document what the end tidal is. Mm, okay. And then when you get that gas result back, you're gonna know what the delta is between your end tidal trace and the PCO2 on your gas. And you'll be able to then use that trend effectively because the delta between them will stay relatively similar across the range. Mm -hmm. Can you just use the PCO2 on a venous blood gas or how do you have to adjust for you, that? You can use the PCO2 on the venous. It's probably also going to be off maybe by five from your arterial. Depends on the individual patient. So as long as you're willing to have a bit so of a, a fudge factor, uh, then I think that's okay. There are some patients where you might want really tight control of it. Mm -hmm. And then you might want to actually do at least one art gas to know it. Okay. Um, but for the average patient, uh, following with an end tidal CO2 is pretty reasonable. Another question I was wondering, because I have seen a lot of variation in practice, I'm curious to hear like what your practice is. Like, How soon after you make a change on the ventilator do you draw an ABG if you were going to order one? So as long as the patient is relatively stable, I will wait half an hour, say. Okay. Um, and I keep adjusting until I'm getting gases back that are stable and in Makes the happy sense. range yeah. that I want. And then once I'm happy with the numbers, I can extend it out longer and maybe I'd only get a gas every four hours or sometimes even every eight hours, depending on the stability of the patient. But you need a little while to see the changes on the gas. That makes sense. For the super sick person, I might be doing them either very regularly or following them continuously with end tidal. I love the point uh, just in general conceptually from like a 10,000 foot perspective about what you said, how you start off somewhere, but that is not where you end. Because I, I do remember early on when I was starting out that it's like you do the high five intubated. It's like, oh man, that part was the most exciting. And then it's like, pass it off. And it's like the RT asks you for the settings, whatever you want. <laughs> and then it's like, you're out and like, you just hope everything's tucked away. But the truth of the matter is that's where you start. Because the, the fact is, is that that's just kind of a place you start and then you're supposed to adjust to make it. And yeah, generally, like RT is able to do it, but like you have to know like the general principles to be able to have a conversation that's functional. Absolutely. And depending on how long patients are staying in your eMERGE, <laughs> yeah. patients may change over the time of their ICU stay. Maybe they start paralyzed, but then their rocuronium wears off and now they're awake. Mm -hmm. And you have to decide whether to resedate or to switch to a support mode. Maybe they start getting better. Maybe they pop a pneumothorax. So every time you have a significant change in patient status, you want to go back and reassess, are these still the right settings? Because that can be a very dynamic process with some patients. Awesome. Cool. Thanks for making it easy. Mm -hmm.